So the funny thing is it actually started several years ago when it just crossed my mind if I wanted to set out one morning from my house and walk to New York through this kind of forbidding landscape known for freeways and fast trains and stuff, how would I do it? And it sort of started as kind of a joke and a challenge to myself. But then when I started looking at it more closely, particularly the how I would do it, how they used to do it in the time of Washington, how did Washington get to his inauguration, which was in New York. Um, I became fascinated by that part of it, but also the fact that between those two places was you know, a good portion of the founding part of our history as, an, as a country. So I so, walked out my door, kissed my wife on the cheek, and took a left and went to New York. It took 26 days. I chose what was by far the most interesting route, which was to go up, um, out of, straight up Rock Creek Park in DC, up through Northern Maryland, skirting around Baltimore, across the Mason-Dixon line. Then I caught the rail line that goes up to York, which happens to be the rail line that Lincoln took both to the Gettysburg Address and to be buried in Illinois. And then I went from York across Lancaster County um, through Chester County down into Philadelphia, which was a little bit of a detour, but an important one because of Philadelphia being what it is. Mm. And then I went up from there through uh, Doylestown, which is a really extraordinary place for reasons I could explain. And then I cut over to the uh, Delaware, down the Delaware River, crossed where Washington crossed in a kayak, up to Princeton, spent a couple of days there, and then I cut across New Jersey and up some curious routes until I, um, I mimicked then the route that Franklin or Jefferson or any of these people used to take to get from Philadelphia to New York. Walking isn't just 20 times slower than driving, three miles versus 60 miles. Um, it's actually not, and it's more than 20 times more meaningful. Um, it's just in every way that you interact with your environment, with the people along the way. It's just so profoundly different, it's really hard to explain. So, yeah. People were say, would say, well, are you gonna walk the Appalachian Trail or are you gonna go on rail trails? Or, and I, you know, I was like, no, look, this is a walk through our history. This is a walk um, through where we are as a civilization. This is a human walk, a, a walk by a human to meet other humans. I, if I want nature, I can go to Montana or something. The whole concept of common ground, which is standing on the same piece of earth and talking to somebody who might be profoundly different than you are, but that you're talking to them with three or four or five feet of distance, just makes it such a difference. And there was one time on my fourth or fifth day, I'd crossed the Mason-Dixon line. My phone, which I use as my navigational tool, the batteries were wore out. I realized I was lost. Um, because I was lost, I had to find a human to guide me. I found this man who had this big, long beard in a, in a barn. His name was Ken Kenny. He was a kind of evangelical um, auctioneer. We got to talking. He had, what? you know, kind of antiquated ideas about um, religion and gender identification, all these various things. Was, and I asked him about what he thought of the state of the country. So he went into a whole thing that um, God was angry at America and was taking his love away and all these various things, which were interesting. They were not really in alignment the way I see the world. But I was interested in what he had to say. I didn't, even, I didn't agree with a lot of what he said. We then got into a fun, I said, give me your auctioneer banter, which he did, which always is fun. And then we started talking about the tractors in the barn that he was going to auction that Saturday. And, uh, you know, at the end, I liked Ken Kenny. He was a funny guy. There were a lot of things that we had in common. There were other things we didn't. And at the end, I said, uh, hey, Ken, do you know why we had this conversation? And he said, why? And I said, my battery wore out, and we were forced to, because I had to find you. So it's that kind of, the, we've lost a lot of that talking to people across cultural divides, but on the same piece of land, you know, face to face. That makes a huge difference. You know, I was never really particularly in suspense about whether I was going to find a lot of beauty between Washington and New York. But um, I think one of the most startling moments I had done, speaking of coming face to face with the 21st century, I had um, gone across this whole portion of New Jersey and I was nearing the Jersey Turnpike, I-95, which I had not encountered. And in some ways, there was my walk and then there was I-95 because I-95 is the refutation of my walk. So I was very conscious of when and how I was going to encounter I-95. So I came to this perfect 19th century town called Cranberry. 
exit 8A off the Jersey Turnpike. And leaving Cranberry, I found, looking on a satellite imagery, was Cranberry Brook that went right through this whole constellation of huge Amazon, Costco, Wayfair distribution centers right along the freeway. And then this little brook went underneath the freeway. I managed to find someone, I won't explain how, who lent me a kayak. And for 30 minutes, I kayaked up this brook, which was quite wide and bizarre and mysterious and Amazonian, through the warehouses with them through the trees and then under the Jersey Turnpike. It was one of the most fantastic stretches of the entire trip because this was like aboriginal, beautiful, basically untouched America. And right there, you could see them through the trees, the warehouses, overnight delivery, and right there, the 12 lanes of I-95. And um, there was something just very powerful about that. <laughs> you know, um, when you say, when you're on the train, there are some glorious places, I know precisely where those glorious places are because without fail, they're when the train explodes over a river and you're suddenly across the Susquehanna, right? And you're like, oh my God, you know? And those moments when I walked at, arrived by foot at the Susquehanna, I spent probably an hour just like, I'm at the Susquehanna. The Susquehanna, which has become a thing we just blow over on a train or blow over in a car, is like a solemn, sacred place. It's actually, I learned, the fifth oldest river in the world and, of course, the source of the Chesapeake. But when you come to it, it's, it's what it, it still may, it retains a lot of its elemental force and power as this thing that was once incredibly hard to cross, you know, and was the start of the, West, the Western frontier for at least a century in our European history. That was the start of the frontier and a really important one. When it comes to Susquehanna, I went that across it on Easter, and Easter afternoon, I had arranged to meet with this guy. This is one of the most powerful moments of the trip. He took me out on the Susquehanna River to these two places called Big Indian and Little Indian Rock, and they are, I need to confirm this, he's quite confident that he's right in saying this, the only places in the entire mid-Atlantic region where um, permanent and still existing marks of the indigenous population are there to be seen. Just to take for instance, you go to Hanover Junction Station, which is the station where Lincoln, um, on his way to Gettysburg, stopped, got out of the train, and waited actually for the governor of, um, of Pennsylvania to come. He didn't come, and then he went to Gettysburg. That was November 1863. April 1865, he comes back through that same station, the train pauses, he's in a casket, he's on his way to Illinois. You come to that station now, the tracks are still there. You just stand there and you look at those tracks. This track took him that way, this track took him that way. It's just an amazing place to be. Just Particularly in the last few days, it was just rapturous. I mean, I, there was, I could describe one moment, maybe this will sound strange, but I, I hadn't seen Manhattan yet. I had gone all the way across Staten Island um, and I had spent the night and then I had walked to the foot of the Bayonne Bridge. I was going to walk over the Bayonne Bridge to get to Bayonne and then walk up to Jersey City and then the next day I was going to cross over. While I was walking up the pedestrian ramp, I just looked up all of a sudden and it was there. And it was so like Great Gatsby, Fitzgerald-esque gorgeous that it was just like crippling. and I was just a, like overcome by the thing. And I literally had to sit down and I was there for about half an hour just thinking about the power of that site of that city in part because of what we've all gone through and yet it's you know enduring beauty and strength. It's so funny because when I came into Manhattan on Friday I, um, I walked up Fifth Avenue and I met a friend of mine who I've known for a long time and we walked up, we were going into Central Park together and then he said uh, let's stop and have a cocktail. And we stopped at Bergdorf, outside Bergdorf Goodman's, and we sit at this bar, and I got a Negroni, and it was like this incredible Negroni. And I said, Martin, this is going to sound strange, but if... No, I said, I'm not sure exactly what a religious experience would look like for a middle-aged urbanite who drinks Negronis, but I think I had one. <laughs>